So here's the big question. How do we live a life full of adventures, travel, and memories on our terms without being millionaires, without previous experience, and without unlimited amounts of time? That's the big question, and this podcast will give you the answers. I'm your co-host, Tayson Whitaker. And I'm Dave Kime, and you're listening to the Live Ultralight Podcast, powered by Outdoor Vitals. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. Today, we are live on the podcast. We are also live on YouTube for this particular episode, and we are going over the pilot episodes for the Live Ultralight podcast. Um, If you missed episode one, you can go back and listen to that on the podcast uh, platform of your choice. Um, This is part two of of these pilot episodes. We're going to be diving a little bit more into um, Outdoor Vitals, the brand, the story, how it got started. Um, Dave's going to be kind of interviewing me Um, Also, if you missed part one, you'll want to go back and listen to that to learn a little bit more about Dave, his backstory, and and, uh, just kind of where he came from, uh, West Philadelphia, right? (laughs) So, now it's Granton, actually, way better than West Philadelphia. So, also with that, though, I did want to quickly mention that we did do a giveaway in part one of this pilot series. So, if you missed that, make sure to either stay to the end of this podcast, where we'll announce it again, or go back and listen to podcast number one um, for that opportunity to win. Uh, for the first few people, I mean, I don't know how many people are going to respond to this, but there's like 50% odds to win something. So make sure and listen to that or stick with us to the end for that to be announced. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to uh, Dave. And he's going to kind of interview me and talk a little bit about um, Outdoor Vitals and maybe why we want to do this podcast, where we're going in 2019, things like that. Yep. Awesome. So for most of you that do know Taysen and follow YouTube, our backstory, you kind of know the business aspect of how the podcast, how the the business started and how Outdoor Vital started. So hopefully with this particular episode, we'll find out more about Taysen's backstory, his personal history, um, things like that, just not as business oriented. Um, So you get to kind of know him as a person and the brand kind of more family oriented. Um, So with that being said, let's just get a little bit about your your backstory, um, where you grew up, how you grew up. um, Did you grow up traveling, adventuring? And if you did, maybe some experiences along the way. Yeah, so I grew up in a small town, 7,000 people. Um, It was actually the big town around there. I thought I was from the big city because everyone that was in the surrounding communities were, you know, farmers, things like that. And so they would come to my city to go to the grocery store and eat out, you know. So I grew up thinking I was from a big city. But regardless, it it provided a lot of opportunities to spend time outside. So, I mean, me with my friends, with my family, I was just always outside, whether it was riding bikes around or scooters or building jumps or... Um, exploring some red rock canyons that were near my house, um, you know, per- finding little alcoves and pretending like they were home for a day, just things like that. And that's just kind of how I grew up. My my family also they were they were actually hunters, um, fishermen, and we would we would be up on the mountain. I'd say almost every other weekend. Parents have this little tiny camp trailer, and most of the time, me and my brother thought it was too cramped in there, so we would sleep outside. And I spent a lot of cold nights out there, but uh, just loved loved the outdoors despite that. Um, I also was did did some Boy Scouts. I'm an Eagle Scout, um, so I I did. That's kind of actually where more of my backpacking came in. I spent a lot of time you know riding motorcycles and four wheelers and doing day hikes and stuff like that. But did a little bit more backpacking and that style of camping um, through Boy Scouts. So. So how would you compare Cedar City, where we're currently at, to, to Richfield? And for me, I, I, I'm, I would say I'm actually from a big city, about 5 million people of, of oh Philadelphia. But how would you compare Richfield um, to, to Cedar, just so maybe I can put that into perspective? Yeah. So I'm actually, the reason I feel like I really like Cedar City is it's a, it's like a bigger version of the city I grew up in. In fact, uh, people around here often compare Richfield to what Cedar was you know, 30 years ago. But what I like about it is both cities have a hometown feel. You can get to know like a lot of people in the community, a lot of, I mean, you just see familiar faces, you get to know people. And so I really like that aspect. But what Cedar has that, that Richfield didn't is, you know, more places to shop, eat out, you know, you know mm-hmm. find more entertainment, a few things like that. But the biggest thing that I love about both cities is within five minutes or less, I can be hiking a trail out of the city, doing something outdoors. I guess that would be my next question too. Like, what are some of the benefits of 
outdoor vitals being based out of southern southern utah and having all the parks and and, and things like that right, right out of our, our back door yeah i would say the biggest thing is um we can find people that to work for us that are that are very outdoor focused outdoor minded it, it can be a little bit harder because we don't have as big of a pool to draw from but um the nice thing is I, we can like everyone in the office, like I would say almost every week when I get back into the office, I can, you know, talk to the team and say, Hey, what'd you guys do this weekend? Yeah. Oh, I went snowboarding or I, or I went hiking or I went biking or I ran down to Zion's with some friends that we're visiting or all sorts of things like that, where I just feel like we get a lot of opportunity to get outdoors. And while we might not have as many people to look at for hiring purposes, um, it's a great place to be and, and we can test our product a lot. I feel like just because we can test it almost daily instead of like go on one big trip and make everything around that one big trip. Yeah, that, that for me, I, I, I love where we're at right now. You can go 40 minutes and you can ski, you can drive another 40 minutes south and you can mountain bike and it's... it's mountain bike in the winter. Yeah, exactly. Drops, temperature drops it, or it raises a lot. It's amazing. The, the, the different, you know, geological rocks and everything like that is is amazing you can't convince uh, too many people to come to utah though. yeah for, that's what i tell my, my my friends come to visit i'm always like all right now don't go back to the east coast and tell everybody about this um yeah. so growing up did you, what about some some traveling or some some things like that that you might have experienced so i really didn't travel much out of utah growing up um farthest i went was like disneyland in california and i was pretty much like straight down straight back went to beach like one one day or like half a day. Um, so I didn't really travel much in the way of that, but I did spend a lot of time visiting lots of parts of Utah. Um, so what actually got me hooked on traveling was when I was um, 19 years old, I went and served an LDS mission in Malaysia and in Singapore. And when I went there, I just fell in love with the people, fell in love with the culture and like the landscapes, the rainforest, just different aspects. And I was like, holy cow, like as much as I love seeing all of Utah, and the dynamics there, like there's a whole world to explore. And that like, I came back from that experience and was like, man, I, I want to travel the world now. I want to see all these different parts of it. Nice. Um, so let's kind of talk about giving back too with that. I know that's part of, you know, here at Outdoor Vitals, we like to give back uh, 1% of sales and things like that. And we recently gave $40,000 to, to Charity Water. And how did that organization and your travels, you know, to this, you know, the Asia and things like that, how, how do they correlate together? Yeah, so I would say that when I, when I went to Malaysia, I probably, I mean, I grew up in America just with that mindset of like, you got to watch out for your own, you're part of you know, you're American and, and it's you kind of, I don't know, you start to build up some mental walls, I would almost say with these other countries. And when I went to these other countries and I, you know, fell in love with the people and made friends and, and saw what, what they lived through is kind of like, man, you know, they're fantastic people. And the only difference between them and me is they were born here and I was born there. And so I, I kind of quit seeing, seeing the world in, in those different fashions of, you know, American, non-American or whatever it was. And I started to feel like, man, you know, I have such opportunity. Like, like I would look at these people like, man, they wouldn't know what to do if they worked a five day work week. They wouldn't know what to do if they had like healthcare, <laughs> uh, just things like that. And so I came back um, from Malaysia thinking, you know, I wanted to figure out a way that I could apply myself into places like that. Fortunately, you know, when I was in Malaysia, I, I got to spend a lot of time educating people and helping them in those regards, but also the organization I was with, they did a lot of things like clean water projects and they also like I saw them, you know, give away like 50 wheelchairs into a community and we got to, you know, see those go into homes and and that just kind of planted that bug of like, man, you know, we can we can make a difference. The other thing was is I spent a lot of times for particularly with charity water, I spent a lot of times in these people's homes and they're very they're very giving. And so you get in there and they want to make you, you know, juice if they have it or they give you water and crackers. And um, most of the time we we couldn't drink them because the water sources that they had were not clean. And for us, I mean, it was, it was super risky to make us sick. And for them, it would make them sick too, but they were a lot stronger with it. And they had a lot of, um, deaths that I contribute to water, but they didn't really know what happened because they, they, if they went to the hospital, they didn't really get definitive answers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they would drink it, but we would often not, we'd even have to watch for ice cubes because sometimes they'd filter the water, but not the ice cubes. Just things like that, yeah. you know, and so we were constantly worried about that. And so when I, I got in touch with Charity Water and I watched actually their their founder speak and go through the whole process of how they keep, you know, rent and marketing money separate from like what we donated, how that goes straight into the country. 
And he talked a lot about the health aspect and how um, so much of the health in these countries is is contributed, like comes back to just the water. And that made that just made a ton of sense to me because um, there was just dirty water everywhere. And so I saw a, a way for us to have a huge impact on communities. Also with wells, like wells, once they're dug, they can contribute water for a very, very long time. And so I want to contribute any money that we do donate. I want it to be, you know, long lasting, sustainable. I don't want to donate something mm-hmm. that... It's going to be very short term. Yeah, definitely. Like that's one thing for me, at least traveling. You don't realize how good you have it when you see some of the the way, you know, other people live. And that's what me and my wife were just talking about. Like I feel uh, being born in, in the United States, like you you kind of won. You already started. You The, the <laughs> life lottery, you, you kind of already, already hit that. And um, so I would say my next question is you see a lot of brands kind of giving back now and um, – what would be one of the challenges, like being kind of a, a smaller start? I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be a challenge, but like a, a pro and a con of being a, a smaller brand versus a larger brand, like things that we can and can't do yeah. compared to the the North Faces and the Patagonias of the world. Yeah, I mean, a lot of those companies they started similar to us, and they had to grow through a lot of the stuff that that we're going through ourselves, but it's really, really popular for companies to just go out and raise money and start. And anytime you raise money and start, you get to look at things a hundred percent different than, than, you know, we get to look at things, you know, if they need new hires, they just go hire them. If they want to do things a certain way, they just go do it. And they kind of see what happens. Essentially, it's kind of like the difference between like, I don't know, growing up is easier to spend your parents' money than your own money that you earned. Right. Yeah. Um, it's easy to, to spend venture capital as compared to your own money in that fight. So I'd say a big con for us is we can't act and grow as fast. We can't like make big rash decisions quickly and, and like, you know, have put a lot of risk out there essentially, but with high risk and kind of high reward. So there's some companies that started almost similar time as us that are massive, massive companies, but you know, they raised like $32 million and, and they've done things like that. And so that's the con is we can't, we can't have as big of an impact as fast. Um, but I'd say the pro with it is I, you know, you look at Patagonia versus let's say the North face Patagonia is still privately held and the following they have, the impact they have, the culture they have is tremendous compared to say the North face, which is, you know, more investment owned now. And, and that's, that's kind of how I see us. It's like, it's going to take us slower growth, but we're going to make better decisions. Hopefully we get to focus on 10 years out instead of the short term. And, and at the end of the day, our shareholders aren't investors. Our shareholders are those buying from us. Um, so there's pros and cons. The other pro I would say just, just real quickly is, you know, we started this company four and a half, five years ago, and, uh, there's been big learning curves. You know, this is my first company. Uh, A lot of these other companies out there, maybe it's their fifth company, but this is the one and only company for me. I, I'm, I'm not going to like let this go under, which means, um, there's some learning involved for me, but, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of risk, but there's a lot of reward too. And I think also it's nice to, you know, being able to adapt on the fly and things like that. Just being here for the two years that I've been and just different, different things that you can kind of switch up and where bigger companies, you know, they're planning two, three years out and, and things like that. So I definitely like the, the, you know, lean side of what we're able to do here. Yeah, we, we essentially, if we find something we want to change, we can change it on the spot. We're not committed to a year's production of it. If we were a retail based company, we would have to produce the same product for an entire year, then make that switch. But a lot of these companies, just like you said, they have got two or three years out already booked. Mm-hmm. So when we find a new product that comes to market, like let's say the, the Loftec insulation, we can release it so much faster mm-hmm. than anyone else because of, of that advantage. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then with that being said, wh- where do you see Outdoor Vitals heading in the future? 2019, we'll, we'll say 2019, maybe beyond, but the, the some future goals that you have for Outdoor Vitals or where are you kind of see uh, in the brand head yeah so that's been definitely a part of the learning curve is is dialing that in i'd say the last year and a half two years um we've been spending a lot of time kind of internally um reflecting and figuring out exactly who we want to be as a brand um, i feel like we always knew but maybe our messaging wasn't clear enough for people to understand uh, we talked a little bit about like price we talked about price too much and so people started thinking we were a budget brand and so 
over the last two years, we've we've been able to really dial in on on who we are as a brand. And so going forward for us, I mean, we're really doubling down on that live ultra light, which means we're you know we're part lifestyle, but we're we're definitely still extremely outdoor focused. Um, really focused on the ultra light aspect, which means um, as a pro- like on our product lines, not everything has been ultra light in the past. So we're we're literally letting those products fall off of our our catalog. Um, they're going to be disappearing and we're going to be redesigning things. For instance, like uh, with these backpacks right here, they're great backpacks, but they're not light enough to be considered ultra light and they don't fall in our brand anymore. And so they're eventually going to be going away and we're going to be replacing those. So, um, you know, that's part of kind of some of the changes we're doing. Um, I don't know. I feel like there's so many changes. It's hard to like nail them down, but um, yeah, I feel like, I feel like we've really found our voice in the last like two years, found our stride. We've learned a lot of lessons and now we get to focus on what we really want to become. Whereas honestly, from the beginning, um, there was a time when it was literally like, Hey, we gotta, we gotta like sell stuff just to, just to become a company. And then it's like, once we got to that point, it's like, okay, now let's morph it into what the long-term vision always was, which is what we're finally getting to really implement right now. I mean, I know something you're excited about, I'm excited about, and maybe we can speak about, you know, maybe new partnerships and, and manufacturers and, and things like that as we kind of move forward and where you see that going or the direction that we're heading in. Yeah. So in the very beginning, I had no connections in this industry. Um, I just had a vision and what I wanted to see happen and what I, how I wanted to help people. And so uh, very fortunately, our very first manufacturer has turned into a great partnership. Um, but as we grew, you know, we started bringing in more manufacturers and different things, um, and they were good. But the thing is, we didn't want to be good. We wanted to be great. And so the more we've grown, the more I've worked on relationships and getting um, into, you know, different partnerships. And, and so, I mean, even just recently, like with, with the Loft Tech Jackets and some other stuff we've got in the pipeline, we've essentially moved up that ladder to where we're now working with with great manufacturers best Mm. top top in the world type manufacturers um those wouldn't have been available to us before but we've just kept at it kept working at it and and now those are available for us so it's really exciting to see like we're going to be turning out some of the highest end products you know anywhere in the world and and that's really exciting to me that's what i always wanted to do but um it took us a little while to build and build and get here so if you are listening you've been a follower for a long time like I just want to thank you guys. Like you guys have done a lot for us and you've made it possible for us to be a direct to consumer brand producing the top tier of products. Yeah, definitely. I would say people that have been following around the last few years are, are going to be really excited with the next year or two with some of the products and just different things that we're, we're coming out with. Um, I would say that's probably it on, on the, the branding and outdoor vitals. I guess we can pop back to to you personally, um, do you still have time to get out and, you know, adventure and, and things like that? I, I guess I'm curious of a work life business type, type balance. And that's something, you know, that we've talked about here in the company and hopefully what we're going to talk about on, on this podcast and stuff like that is kind of balancing your, your work life, balancing, still getting out and adventuring. And I know you have some, some shows, some trade shows and things like that coming up, but, um, do you still have time to do that? And would you like to do more or kind of speak on that a little bit? Yeah. I, you know, balance is a, is an interesting word. I mean, everyone talks about balance. They strive for balance. And, and a lot of people, they believe balance is like eight hours of sleep, eight hours at work, eight hours at home. Like that's the balance. <laughs> right. And for me personally, I don't, I don't know if I believe in that level of balance. Um, I believe that that when you're working in, in stuff you're passionate with, um, sometimes there's going to be imbalance, but hopefully over the long term, it creates more of that balance. I don't think you can create anything great by being perfectly balanced. Hey, Ovi Tribe, if you're watching this on YouTube, I apologize. We had a technical difficulty and our camera shut off at about the 20 minute mark of a 35 minute episode. Um, so you missed the very tail end of this podcast where we talked about um, our favorite kind of tips or things to just talk about with, with, uh, going outdoors in the winter time. So if you want to hear that or how to be entered into the giveaway, uh, make sure to jump over and listen to it on the podcast. I will quickly say though, that I was going to tell you how to enter the giveaway. So I'll quickly recap that. Essentially what we're doing is we're giving away between 10 and 30 prizes. If you leave a review 
on your podcasting app of choice. iTunes is the most common or, or others if you're Android. Uh, but if you go leave a review there, you'll be entered into win. Um, for this particular episode, what we're going to do is for every 20 people that enter, we'll give away 10 prizes. So you have a 50% chance of winning. Um, and what we're giving away is either a inflatable stretch pillow. These are two and a half inch or two and a half ounce stretch pillows. Um, you can win a t-shirt, uh, one of our Live Ultralight t-shirts, or you can pick a uh, Take Less See More shirt like this. It's got mountains and that saying on it. Um, you'll be able to pick one of those three prizes. What we're going to do though is we're going to cap this at 30 total prizes, which means 60 reviews. Um, <clears throat> if, if there's more than 60, obviously all will still be entered until we cap that, but um, we'll give up to 30 prizes. So if there's less than 60 reviews, you got a 50% chance of winning. So jump over there, leave a quick review on this. We really appreciate it. It'll help us get found. It'll help us um, help more people to, to live ultralight. Um, anyways, make sure to jump over to your podcasting app also and subscribe. Uh, I apologize for that technical difficulty, but if you jump over there and subscribe and listen, you'll be able to hear the tail end of, of this conversation where we talk about our favorite tips for uh, backpacking in the winter. But thanks for joining us. Again, I apologize for that. We'll catch you on the next video or podcast.